You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ross Tokel, and I am the executive associate to the director at the East West Center in Washington. Thank you all for joining us for what is sure to be a fascinating discussion with Dr. Mo Taylor on North Korea and Guyana's relations during the Cold War. Today's discussion is the fifth in a series that is examining North Korea's historical and contemporary relations with countries in the Global South. And this series builds off a joint project between the East-West Center and the National Committee on North Korea titled North Korea in the World, which I urge you all to look at. North Korea in the World is an interactive online resource on North Korea's external relations that provides in-depth analysis and information on North Korea's international ties. Today's discussion will be moderated by Dan Wirtz, who is Senior Advisor at National Committee on North Korea, where he has worked since 2011. Dan manages NCNK research and publications, and he is the lead researcher and editor of the North Korea in the World website. He also serves as chair of the steering committee of George Washington University's North Korea Economic Forum. Dan received master's degrees in international and world history and a joint program from Columbia University and the London School of Economics and a bachelor's degree in history from Bolzian University. So Dan, it's a pleasure as always for us at the East West Center to be partnering with you and with your team at NCNK. Uh, with that, thank you, Dan, and over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Ross. It's great to be here today. Uh, I'm really excited about today's discussion on North Korea's relations with Guyana and with Latin America more broadly. Uh, Dr. Mo Taylor, who's here with us today, uh, has done some really groundbreaking research on this relationship, along with a handful of other scholars. And it'll be great to really delve into what I think is a very fascinating and, and little known relationship. Uh, as always, uh, for people in the Zoom webinar audience, uh, please feel free to ask questions using the question and answer function. I'll start with a conversation with Dr. Taylor and uh, we'll take questions from the audience as we move along. Uh, Dr. Taylor holds his PhD degree in history from the University of British Columbia, where he wrote his dissertation on North Korea and revol revolutionary movements in Latin America. He's currently a Social Sciences and Humanity Research Council of Canada postdoc fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So Dr. Taylor, I wanna to start uh, today's discussion with a kind of general question. You've written that North Korea and Guyana enjoyed a decade of exceptionally intimate political, economic, military, and cultural cooperation uh, from roughly 1974 to 1985. How did this come to be? How did two small countries on opposite sides of the globe with such very different uh, histories, cultures, political systems uh, come to have this kind of very close partnership. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks for the introduction and um, thanks for having me today. Um, so this relationship that develops between the DPRK and Guyana in the mid 1970s um, is best understood in the context of a new direction in DPRK foreign policy that really gets underway in the early 1970s, in which the DPRK is really seeking greater integration with and um, exchange with the international community, um, particularly in the global south or what was called the third world. Um, in the past, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean, the opportunities for the DPRK to have what we would think of as normal bilateral state-to-state -state relations were, were quite limited. And so in that period, the DPRK leadership was more interested in cultivating relationships with left-wing opposition movements, revolutionary movements, anti-colonial movements. Um, in the early 1970s, for a whole number of reasons, this foreign policy strategy undergoes a, a fairly radical shift to a much more moderate one um, focused on peaceful diplomacy, multilateralism, particularly within the global south. Um, key to this new direction in foreign policy is the effort to build a coalition of support within the third world for what from 1973 onward it's calling its five point plan for Korean reunification. Um, and like I said, there's a whole lot of factors pushing 
uh, DPRK foreign policy in this new direction, the key is the rise of the non-aligned movement, which the DPRK leadership develops a, a real enthusiasm for, and the growing power of third world countries of, of the third world within the United Nations General Assembly as a consequence of decolonization. Um, so there are different ways in which the DPRK can uh, utilize this to build this coalition of support within the third world. Um, it's pursuing bilateral ties at the state to state level. It's offering its solidarity with um, countries with popular quote unquote third world causes. It's um, positioning itself as a model for the third world as a country that has something to offer and to teach um, countries in the global south struggling with the challenges of underdevelopment of foreign domination of the economy. Um, and, and by promoting a DPRK solidarity movement at a grassroots level, uh, at the level of civil society. So this is the context in which Guyana becomes a natural ally for the DPRK in this period. Um, why? For a number of reasons, chiefly because Guyana itself is seeking to play somewhat of a leadership role in the non-aligned movement in this period. Um, part of this is Guyana's prime minister, Forbes Burnham, leader of the People's National Congress or PNC, develops a reputation under his leadership, Guyana develops a reputation for being an extremely we might even say aggressive and outspoken advocate for, again, quote unquote, third world causes in international fora. And as the DPRK is seeking new allies in the global south that will act on its behalf and support this five point plan for reunification, uh, Guyana is uh, an appealing ally in this sense. Also, we could say that if in this period, the DPRK is positioning itself as a teacher. Guyana in this period is positioning itself as the student that is eager to learn, we could say. And we can get more into that um, later. Um, but you know, essentially Guyana was after things that the DPRK could offer. Um, Guyana was in search of solidarity, uh, in particular in the context of its of the threat posed to it by Venezuela. Guyana has a longstanding territorial dispute uh, with Venezuela that was uh, heating up in the 1970s in terms of economic and military assistance. Um, and so that is how I would best describe sort of the initial genesis of this partnership between Guyana and the DPRK in the mid 1970s. I think from there, uh, political and ideological uh, bonds develop, but um, you know we can we can talk about that as we go on in the discussion. Yeah. So, what as these bonds began to develop, what was the scope of the relationship? You know, in terms of both ideology and you know economic, military support, etc. So, what was the what of the relationship? What is the scope? The scope. Um, it was very broad and very wide um, in terms of. Uh, economic, techno, technical cooperation. Um, Guyana received a lot of support from the DPRK in terms of its goals of agricultural, uh, of food self-sufficiency or what we today might call food sovereignty. Um, so a lot of the assistance the DPRK was able to provide for Guyana was in the realm of, realm of agriculture, fishing, uh, drainage and irrigation. Um, so this may have been efforts to increase the productivity of traditional agricultural sectors such as rice, to uh, implement, implement new ones in line with the Guyanese government's uh, agenda of relying less on, uh, on imports, on food imports and being able to produce more things locally. Um, it meant material sport support for agriculture uh, to boost agricultural productivity. So things such as tractors, uh, boat motors for fishing boats, um, farming equipment, machinery implements. Um, some of the assistance which was coming from North Korea was more um, industrial and extractive. Most notably, the DPRK built a glass factory in Guyana. Um, 
there were a lot of projects that preliminary uh, planning or construction begin, but were cut short because overall, um, this was a relatively brief relationship after all, in the sense that it lasts about a decade. It lasts from uh, the establishment of the diplomatic relations in 1974. It peaks in the late 70s. However, Forbes Burnham dies uh, quite unexpectedly in 1985. And this really begins the decline um, of the DPRK Guyana relationship. So a lot of projects in which preliminary work began, this included uh, gold mining, um, manganese mining, hydroelectric development, um, never really got off the ground because that relationship was cut short. Um, I have to mention military assistance. Um, this was very important for Guyana in light of the, the very real threat it faced from Venezuela. So uh, the DPRK was able to provide uh, a lot of military hardware to Guyana that it didn't previously have, um, artillery, um, military patrol boats. Um, officers of the Korean People's Army were actually stationed in Guyana, uh, providing artillery training. Um, uh, and then there was exchange and cooperation um, in the realm of education and culture, which maybe we can talk about later because that's kind of its own separate topic, but that involved things such as mass games, um, Guyana's efforts to adopt policies and projects or to implement projects inspired by projects it observed in the DPRK related to education, youth development, cultural construction. Um, and, um, you know, on the other hand, there were things that Guyana was able to provide for the DPRK. So it, it wasn't simply one country receiving aid and assistance from the other, although definitely that relationship with aid was asymmetric. Um, there were things Guyana could provide to the DPRK as well. This included bauxite, this included timber, um, and per perhaps most ex uh, significantly, um, the government of Guyana created a English as a second language program for North Korean students at the University of Guyana. Um, and as far as I know, this is the, Guyana is the only non-communist country in which North Koreans in large numbers live, went to live and study, as far as I know. Um, and uh, yeah, lots of, lots of Guyanese who, who visited the DPRK in this period have funny anecdotes about North Koreans who speak English with a Guyanese accent as, as a result of this period of cooperation. And a lot of uh, North Korean diplomats and, and translators, you know, learn English in Guyana. Was that, you know, a pretty big pipeline for them? Is my understanding, yes. Now, many of these were um, fairly young students. So um, it wasn't always clear what profession they were moving on to. But I've since um, been told by North Korean diplomats that, yeah, many of the best English speakers in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are graduates of that program. So my understanding is that many of these North Koreans who lived and studied English in Guyana went on um, to careers in the diplomatic sector. Fascinating. And you mentioned that, you know, North Korea's kind of general uh, ideological orientation of supporting uh, you know, anti-imperialist, uh, kind of third worldist uh, governments and the third world movement uh, was important for uh, developing the scope of its relationship uh, with Guyana under Forbes Forum. Uh, but was there anything, um, you know, particularly about the North Korean model uh, that appealed to the Burnham government, the kind of uh, cult of personality around Kim Il-sung, the kind of highly uh, disciplined structure of, of North Korea society? Yeah, well, definitely Forbes Burnham and other people in the PNC legitimate, in the PNC leadership were genuine admirers of, of Kim Il-sung and of the political system that they observed in the DPRK. Um, a few factors are key here. So you have to understand in this period, Burnham had his own unique doctrine of his own invention that he called cooperative socialism. Not unlike Juche, this was defined as Marxism-Leninism adapted to Guyanese conditions. 
as a distinctly Guyanese road to socialism. Um, this is part of a broader trend that was taking place in the third world. You have other examples of this kind of, um, you know, African socialism, Arab socialism, uh, Julius Nareri with, with his Ujama socialism, uh, Gaddafi's Green Book, et cetera. Um, so Burnham, at, to some extent, was, was in, a, in a, broader, um, a broader atmosphere, a broader political climate taking place within the, the non-aligned third world. Um, key to Burnham's doctrine of cooperative socialism was the principle of self-reliance. So this was, you could say maybe this was the first point of connection between cooperative socialism and Juche or what Burnham admired about the DPRK, this idea that the DPRK had reached a very high level of self-sufficiency. Um, the key development goal of the Burnham government was called feed, clothe, house, FCH, um, that Guyana would become totally self-sufficient in food, clothing, and housing by 1976 originally. That was the first goalpost. That didn't happen. It never happened, but that was the goal, self-sufficiency in, in food, clothing, and housing. Um, the second aspect is that Burnham believed that education was the foundation of development. Um, in, in the context of dying in the 1970s, development, mean, development means the building of socialism. So the idea that to transform objective conditions, you must transform first subjective conditions. To build the material and eco economic basis for socialism, you must first translate, transform the, the mentality, the values, the way of thinking of the masses. And you do this through education and through culture, uh, what Burnham would call a cultural revolution. Um, again, there's a real obvious parallel here, parallel here between this and the ideology of the Korean Workers' Party. So again, Burnham believed um, the DPRK was a, a society, was a system where this transformation of, of people's values, of their attitudes in a way that was necessary to build socialism had been achieved. Um, and you mentioned discipline. Key here is the idea of discipline. Um, and I've argued this is actually something, you, you can't confine this to Burnham. This is a much um, more deeply ingrained attitude in Guyanese society. It's still uh, a popular idea in Guyana. Um, that Guyana's problems can be largely attributed to a lack of discipline. Uh, in Burnham's analysis, this lack of discipline was a legacy of colonialism. And that key to Guyana's progress was installing a new ethos of discipline in the population through culture, through education. And um, there's no doubt that when you, when you speak to former um, leaders in the PNC, Guyanese officials who visited the DPRK in the 1970s and the 1980s, and you ask them, you know, what did Burnham admire most about the DPRK? Um, what did you admire the most about the DPRK? By far the most common answer you will get is the discipline. This idea that, that the DPRK had this uh, incredibly disciplined citizenry that was responsible for its achievements in, in, in areas such as, uh, you know, whether it's, it's an industrial output, agriculture, healthcare, education, and that Diana needed that kind of discipline if it wanted to progress in a similar way. This is key to the admiration that Forbes, Burnham, and other PNC leaders had for the DPRK. And that would seem to tie pretty closely into the mass games and the PNC government's uh, receptivity uh, to have North Koreans come and kind of replicate uh, in, in the Guyanese context, the mass games. Can you explain a little bit about uh, the history behind that and how it evolved? Yeah, well, um, of course, uh, you know, mass games have a very long history going back to 18th century Europe. Um, it became a very big part of the cultural sphere of the communist bloc during the Cold War. But essentially, they are, they are mass gymnastics performances, um, which emphasize 
collectivism, physical discipline over individual achievement. Um, and, you know, they are wrapped up in the communist tradition of the new man, of, of forms of, uh, of, of culture and physical activity that will mold ideal socialist citizens by installing these values of discipline, discipline, collectivism, patriotism, etc. cetera. Um, Burnham really admired the mass games, exactly as you suggest. He saw this as an example of the way that the DPRK installed these positive values in its youth. And so he requested that the DPRK assist him in establishing mass games in Guyana. So this begins in 1979. The first mass games in Guyana is in 1980. It continues uh, annually um, until 1992 with the end of the PNC government. Um, but um, yeah, in a way, what's fascinating about the mass games, I mean, I think there's two things that are fascinating about the story of mass games in Guyana. One is that it was a distinctly Guyanese appropriation of the North Korean medium. So what I mean by that is, although the, the medium was adopted from the DPRK and it followed the same structure, um, the visual, musical, artistic, political, cultural content was completely Guyanese. So it was mass games, but it was about Guyana. It was about Guyana's history, Guyana's goals, um, Guyana's culture, Guyana's natural beauty, um, it was about Forbes Burnham. It was about the PNC to an extent. Um, and, uh, you know, the music was Calypso music and steel pan. Um, the costumes were, reflected a Caribbean aesthetic. Um, the second thing that I think is really fascinating about this level of artistic collaboration between the DPRK and Guyana in this period is, in a way, this had a bigger impact on on mainstream Guyanese society than any other feature of DPRK Guyana cooperation, because it had a, it, it was something taking place on a mass level, right? Um, you know, um, young, a huge swath of Guyanese society was impacted by mass games in some way, whether you were a young person in elementary school um, who was training for several months of the year and performing in the mass games, whether you, you were a parent and you had children that were in the mass games. So, you know, most Guyanese people that were around in the 1980s remember the mass games and have very strong feelings about it either one way or the other. Um, mass games were controversial. Um, you, can, you can see differences with how people who were parents at the time and their kids were in mass games, how they remember it versus the reflections of, of people who were children themselves and participating in the performances. Um, however, um, there's no doubt that, you know, mass games was a major part of the cultural life of Guyana for, for over a decade. And the mass games, if I'm not incorrect, they continued for several years uh, after Forbes Burnham's death, correct? So how, how do they kind of continue on and, uh, and finally come to an end. Yeah. Well, when Forbes Burnham died in 1985, he was succeeded by Desmond Hoyt. Um, Desmond Hoyt was generally seen as representing what we could call the right wing of the PNC. So Hoyt did not want to make a total break with all the legacy of Burnham but he certainly felt that many of Burnham's policies and projects were ideologically driven and not pragmatic. He believed, Hoyt believed that as a country located in the Western hemisphere, Diana's best interests were served by repairing its relationship with the United States, which had really suffered um, throughout the 1970s and early eighties under Burnham and the International Monetary Fund, which you know, had essentially um, blacklisted Guyana by this time. Um, so Burnham, uh, pardon me, Hoyt leads the shift away from a lot of these more radical socialist oriented policies. Mass Games continues, 
1992, Diana has the first um, widely recognized as the first free democratic elections it's had in 28 years. And the PNC is voted out of office. The new party coming in, the opposition PPP, the People's Progressive Party, really wants to uh, cleanse all traces of the Burnham era. So that includes the, the end the mass games and even a lot of the, the photographic and uh, film uh, documentation of the mass games was destroyed, unfortunately. So then I, I wonder what's the legacy of this decade plus of collaboration Guyana today? Um, you mentioned that you know parents of, of children, children themselves who participated in the mass games uh, tend to remember them fondly. Is there still kind of a visible cultural imprint based on this uh, decade of cooperation, or is it something that you know maybe no. the older generation uh, remembers, but you know doesn't really have much of an impact on on younger Guinea? Yeah, maybe I have three comments to make. Um, regarding that question. One, I should clarify. Um, I wouldn't say that um, Guyanese um, remember mass games fondly. I would say they are deeply divided how they remember mass games. Certainly some rem remember it fondly. Um, others don't. Um, and, I, and I, in my experience, it is the young people that were the actual the performers who tend to remember it more fondly than the parents who were stressed out because their children were losing class time to train for this annual performance that they may not have accepted or understood the, the real importance of, right? Um, going back to the legacy, um, you know, it's a really interesting question. The main Guyanese artist for Mass Games is a man named George Simon, a very famous Guyanese artist. He was the one hired by the government of Guyana to learn the techniques of mass games, of painting the panoramic uh, backdrops, the performances that are made through the card books, right? Um, he was hired by the government of Guyana to learn these artistic techniques from the North Koreans who came to Guyana. And, and he became the artistic director of mass games because the North Koreans are only deeply involved in the early years and then they pass it on to Guyanese organizers and artists and choreographers, etc. George Simon um, credits this period of working with these North Korean artists as, as really um, pivotal in his development as an artist. He goes on to be, become arguably Guyana's most famous artist, certainly one of the most famous. Um, he adapts the techniques he learned from the North Koreans to mural art, right? Being able to paint on such a large scale. Keith then, um, he belongs to Guyana's indigenous community or, or Amerindians as they're called in Guyana. He's particularly interested in teaching these techniques and teaching mural art to young up and coming indigenous artists. He's responsible, him and his students are now responsible for a lot of very famous murals around Guyana. So in that sense, you could argue that um, the DPRK really did have an impact on the development of, of the arts in Guyana. Certainly George Simon would, would argue that they did. Um, but lastly, I would say more broadly, Guyana is in a really interesting juncture today because there's no doubt that times were tough in the Burnham era. There's no, there's no question about that. No matter how much, there are people that really admire Burnham, um, but they would, nobody would dispute that times were tough economically. And we can debate, and Guyanese are always debating what was responsible for those economic hardships, right? And how much can be put at the foot of Burnham and how much was, um, caused by external conditions that the government had no control over, right? That's an ongoing debate. Um, however, as tough as things were in the Burnham era, um, there've been a lot of troubling developments in Guyana since then, you know? Uh, the rise of narco politics, um, astronomical corruption, uh, austerity politics, privatization, 
uh, mass environmental destruction by multinational mining and logging companies. Um, education was free in the Burnham era from nursery to university, as Burnham used to like to say, you know, the privatization, the reprivatization of education. This inevitably creates nostalgia for the Burnham era, right? Especially among people that were, that are too young to really remember what it was like. And so there's a fascinating phenomenon that you see in Guyana today of, of, of people of a certain generation who either weren't alive in the Burnham era or were too, are too young to really remember it who are, are kind of looking at this past history and these ideas, you know, maybe Guyana can become self-sufficient in food, you know, um, education should be a right, housing should be a right. And they're looking at this legacy and trying to understand what went wrong. You know, why did we move away from these kind of ideas and policies? Uh, why didn't they work? Um, do they provide clues to, um, directions we can take in the future as we grapple with all these problems Guyana faces today. So, um, you know, it's an, it's an ambiguous legacy, right? Um, but it, it haunts the present in a, in a certain way. Thank you. And I think we're gonna turn to a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, first, Lynn Ford asks, where was Walter Rodney in all this? And Walter Rodney being, uh, pretty well-known uh, socialist yeah. intellectual from Guyana at yeah. the time. Yeah. Well, um, you know, Walter Rodney and, um, you know, and, and what he experienced and his ultimate fate in Guyana is really the, um, the biggest blight on Burnham's legacy. You know? um, Walter Rodney, a uh, well-known and respected radical scholar and political activist, um, he had been abroad for many years, but he returns to Guyana in 1974 to accept the position as head of the history department at the University of Guyana. Um, Burnham allegedly intervenes to block this appointment. He sees Walter Rodney as a threat. Walter Rodney by this time has a reputation as an advocate of black power. This is the era of black power in the Caribbean. Um, and as a, as a, you could say, an ultra leftist, a very radical leftist, a radical socialist. Um, Walter Rodney emerges as the leader of a political movement, which later becomes a political party called the Working People's Alliance, the WPA. And he becomes a real thorn in Burnham's side. Um, Burnham is claiming to be a socialist and uh, building a socialist society. Walter Rodney and the WPA say, no, you're not. You're a fraudulent socialist. Uh, we are for real socialism. Um, a fascinating thing about Diana's, Diana's politics up until, well, really during the entire Cold War, it was a, essentially a three-party political arena and they were all socialist parties. It was a socialist government defending itself against two socialist opposition parties. And they're all accusing the other of not understanding what socialism means. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Walter Rodney was assassinated in 1980. And, um, you know, uh, there's little doubt in anyone's mind today that the Burnham government was responsible for his death. And did Walter Rodney, did he have any kind of comments or, um, you know, impressions on the North Korea relationship at the time? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, it's funny, I'm gonna, I'll come back to Rodney. The other major opposition party in the country is the PPP led by Chetty Jagan, um, which was, was the, you know, the Moscow recognized Marxist Leninist vanguard party in Guyana. Um, unlike the WPA, it by the mid 70s, mid 70s is taking a position towards the government of, um, we support some of what you're doing in principle. We just think you're doing it wrong. And uh, you've got a lot of problems with corruption in your, in your government and your party. And um, uh, it, it called its, its, its position critical support. Um, so the, the, the PPP really um, supported Burnham having closer relations with the DPRK. 
uh, supporting the DPRK at the UN General Assembly, supporting the Five Point Plan for Reunification. Walter Rodney represented a younger generation of the left. We could call it the, the West Indies 1968 generation, right? Which had a different set of influences. Um, and, you know, part of that kind of more, um, these ideas coming out of the new left and black power was more skepticism towards the, the communist bloc. Um, less, uh, not to say no, no degree of, of support for or admiration for, but you could say that, that Rodney's generation was more critical of, you know, actually existing socialism. And so um, Rodney's position was actually that um, Burnham's government's relations with countries like the DPRK uh, and you know, to the extent that it had relations with the Soviet Union and Cuba as well, were superficial. That they were, they were more, they were part of the performance um, that masked ulterior motives, right? Rodney's position was that Burnham isn't really a socialist. This isn't a socialist government. They're not building socialism. Um, so they looked at relations with countries like DPRK as more performative. Than, than reflecting a genuine commitment to radical change. I guess I would, that's how I would describe it. Thanks. And I think that brings us to a set of questions uh, asked by Greg Serlato. Um, he says, thanks for the great presentation. Um, so how does uh, Burnham's branch of socialism compare to Kim Il-sungism? Would you describe Burnham as a discipline of, uh, disciple of Kim Il-sung? or it was more of a kind of special fraternal uh, relationship uh, forged in our style, socialism or communism. Uh, was Burnham's uh, system as repressive as Kim's or was it different? Uh, were there purges, political prisoners, uh, political detentions in Guyana? And were they, if so, you know, inspired by North Korean methods? And finally, Greg asks, uh, what brought about the downfall of socialism in Guyana and what are possible lessons learned for North Korea? Okay, um, yeah, it's a really interesting question. Was Forbes Burnham uh, a, dis a disciple of Kim Il-sung? I mean, on one hand, uh, Forbes Burnham certainly liked to present himself as an original theoretician, right? That was part of his personality call. Um, cooperative socialism was, was uh, his brilliant invention. Um, on the other hand, part of, the Burnham brand was this idea that he could learn from and borrow from different models, even non-socialist models. And he could mix them all together as long as they made sense, as long as they were good for Guyana. And this goes back to his philosophy, philosophy of non-alignment. He really believed that Guyana under his rule would just kind of trade with both sides of the Cold War, cooperate with both sides of the Cold War. Um, he could adapt and learn from different sources. So he wasn't, he never, um, although he did like to sort of position himself as a great leader and a theoretician, he also was not shy about the fact that he was boring adapting from different sources. So um, he was certainly influenced by some things he witnessed in Cuba, uh, in Tanzania, in Yugoslavia. But um, I think more than anyone, he was influenced by the DPRK. Um, and um, there's no doubt that he had great admiration for Kim Il-sung. Um, he wanted, uh, or at least promoted, encouraged people within the PNC to study the works of Kim Il-sung. Um, there were these, uh, all these Juche study groups that were supported by the state in part uh, in Guyana at the time. Um, and, um, you know, the party newspaper for a period, the PNC party newspaper, which is called New Nation, um, features, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be unusual for it to have Kim Il-sung's portrait on the front page, definitely inside its pages, um, theoretical treaties by Kim Il-sung. Um, uh, at the same time, yeah, there's, you know, the DPR, Guyana under Burnham was not 
like an attempt to recreate the North Korean model. He adopted selectively from the DPRK model. Um, at the end of the day, it was something. Um, it was it was something f fundamentally different in 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 many aspects. Um, but uh, certainly in approaches to I would say education and culture is where Burnham really wanted to um, adopt from uh, DPRK the most. Uh, the other questions, um, there was uh, undoubtedly repression in the Burnham area. Um, Burnham, the Burnham government meddled with elections to ensure the PNC would stay in power. It, it stayed in power um, for 28 years in part to these methods. That's not to say Burnham didn't have a degree of popular support among a certain segment of the population because he certainly did. However, um, staying in power partly owed to the government's willingness to interfere in the electoral system. And there was also a degree of, um, of crude repression, um, strike breaking, um, police and soldiers uh, and party militants attacking demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations. Um, and you know, I mentioned the death of Walter Rodney. There were uh, a handful of other um, opposition activists who were killed in this period and who are generally believed um, to have been the victim of the government security forces. I mean, at a, at a, in an era, I mean, Burnham is a contemporary of Pinochet and Pol Pot, right? So um, Guyana may have not looked um, that repressive uh, in comparison, but yeah, there was a degree of, of violent state repression in the Burnham era. Yeah, I hope that answered uh, most of well, that's, those. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. And I want to take, I'll actually take two questions, um, kind of looking at similar subject from different angles. Uh, first, from Dr. Benjamin Young, uh, asking if uh, you were able to interview any Guyanese who worked on any industrial projects along North Koreans, and if so, uh, what were their impressions of the North Korean industrial workers? And on the other side of that question uh, is another question from Catherine Weathersby. Um, do you have any insight into the effect on North Koreans of their time in Guyana? So what were the impressions uh, both ways? Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, um, I have uh, met and known um, Guyanese who have worked alongside North Koreans. Um, my uncle uh, worked alongside North Koreans at the Guyana Pharmaceutical Corporation, which was the state-owned uh, pharmaceutical manufacturer um, established in the 1970s, where there were North Koreans working. Um, yeah, I've I've also you know met my, many Guyanese who who worked alongside North Koreans, uh, North Korean artists uh, in the context of the mass games. Um, you know, the general memory of the North Koreans in Guyana is as these um, incredibly hardworking people, um, very nice, very friendly, um, very helpful is a word I hear a lot. Um, they also have a reputation for a kind of um, uh, a, a zealousness, a zealotry, we could say, you know. Um, I re I'm remembering, um, the former minister of education, Malcolm Paris, once put it, these are people who live their politics 24 hours a day, the way he put it. Um, there's a lot of kind of humorous anecdotes about the clash between the much more disciplined culture of the DPRK and the somewhat stereotypically more laid back, lackadaisical pace of Caribbean culture, you know. Um, when the North Koreans are in town, we have to set our alarms because, you know, um, we're going to show up an hour late, but we know they'll be there 10 minutes early, you know, um, these kind of humorous anecdotes you hear. Um, I would also say some um, Guyanese of this era remember what you could describe as sort of genuine friendships with North Koreans. Um, particularly, I find when it came to artistic collaboration, which is interesting. Um, artists who, Guyanese and North Korean artists who had the opportunities to kind of hang out 
informally and have friendships and and talk about art and, and teach each other different techniques. But often there's also a feeling that they're um, they're somewhat encapsulated, right? Um, they're while they're in Guyana, they are kind of amongst to themselves and and they're limited to the extent that they can um, they can uh, sort of explore and interact in Guyana informally speaking. Um, so uh, and then in uh, in answer to the second question. Um, um, yeah, it, it's funny, you know, Guyana has, to this day, Guyana has a certain reputation within, uh, among North Korean diplomats, among, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, veterans of the, of, of the DPRK, of the Diplomatic Service of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of the Committee for Cultural Exchange of Foreign Countries, they, they remember Guyana, you know, they, they haven't forgotten this legacy of, of close cooperation between the countries. Um, if, you've, if you've ever had the opportunity to visit the Juche Tower in Pyongyang, you'll notice there's, there's more plaques dedicated from Juche study groups and DPRK solidarity committees from Guyana than any other country. I'm, 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 I'm confident in saying that. Um, and, there, and there's also, and this is really interesting, reciprocally, there is a, sometimes a sadness there, right? Um, there are Guyanese of a certain generation that remember this era of close collaboration and feel like they're, they've been out of touch with what's hap been happening in the DPRK since the 1990s, you know? Um, I can tell you that, um, you know, many Guyanese that had the opportunity to visit the DPRK in the 70s and the 80s were really um, affected by the, uh, by the hardship the country faced in the 1990s and hearing the reports of famine and, and food shortages. And, and um, that, was, that was difficult for them to understand as people who had seen the DPRK in the 80s and the 1970s. Um, likewise, I think um, North Koreans who were involved in this era of cooperation with Guyana, they're, they're also left wondering, well, what happened here? You know, we used, to, we used to be such good friends and now, you know, we don't, we don't visit one another. The delegations aren't going back and forth. Um, it doesn't seem like there are the same opportunities for collaboration. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Now, that's great. Uh, Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Uh, we are a little over time, but it's been a really fascinating discussion. And uh, thanks to everyone in our audience uh, for uh, being here today. Uh, we've got one more episode in our North Korea and the World webinar series, uh, August 25th. Uh, we'll be speaking with Dr. Taiko Vanderhoog on North Korea relations with Namibia and Southern Africa. And hope you all tune in then. Uh, Dr. Taylor, thank you again so much. And hope you all have a great day. Okay, thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Esther. Uh, I really appreciate, appreciate the opportunity. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Have a good one.